Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Power and Chaffrey Drainage Commission Scotland Bill Committee in 2018. The first item on our agenda today is to take evidence on the objections to Amendment 9 lodged to the Bill. Two objections to the amendment were received and objectors are here today to speak to both of these objections. Given the specific nature of each objection, we have not considered grouping the objections, so we take evidence on each in turn. We will first hear from Mr and Mrs Watkins speaking to objection one, and once that has concluded, we will then hear from, Misty, from Mr McGregor speaking to objection two. Before we proceed, I will briefly explain the process today and how the meeting will proceed. We have concluded phase one of consideration stage, where we considered and disposed of the objections to the bill, and are now in phase two, the legislative phase. Fifteen amendments were lodged to the bill, and the committee determined that one of those, Amendment 9, relating to the new land plan submitted in April 2018, adversely affected private interests. A new notification and objection period therefore was allowed for, and the committee set a deadline of 20 August 2018 for objections to Amendment 9. Two objections were received, and today, as we did with the objections to the bill, we meet in a quasi-judicial capacity to consider the objections. Once consideration of the objections has concluded, the committee will consider and dispose of the amendments lodged to the bill and will consider each section, schedule and the long title of the bill. At today's meeting, the objectors and promoters will have the opportunity to set out their arguments and to test those arguments through cross-examination. I will manage proceedings. The committee will predominantly listen to both sides, but may come in at times to seek clarification on an issue or to help move things along. I will first invite Mr and Mrs Watkins to set out the points that they wish to make in relation to their objection. The promoters will then have an opportunity to cross-examine them. After this, the roles will be reversed, so the promoter will respond to the points made in the objections and make any other points, and Mr and Mrs Watkins will have an opportunity to cross-examine their promoters. Once we reach the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for each party to make a brief closing statement. The committee will then reflect on what we have heard and come to a view when we meet on Wednesday 26 September 2018. We will then repeat this process with Mr McGregor. We will now move to the formal evidence session and I encourage all speakers to be as concise as possible. I invite Mr and Mrs Watkins to open proceedings by setting out the points they wish to meet, make regarding the objection. Mr and Mrs Watkins. Well, thank you and uh, good morning everyone. We would like to thank the Parliamentary Committee and the promoters for inviting us to give evidence today. We've lived alongside the POW for 18 years and paid our dues for the maintenance regularly. <clears throat> our objections are basically as set out in the letter and in Appendix 1. As you will have seen from the letter, we do not own the actual Abbey site. It is owned by the Earl of Kinnul. The original planning consent clearly states the house site, which includes access from the road and the front lawn, is restricted to 0 0.1 of a hectare, which is just under a quarter of an acre. And, I quote from Perth and Kinross planning consent, condition number six, which says, the site shall be used for residential purposes only, and no agricultural or industrial development will be permitted on the site or in the immediate vicinity of Inchaffrey Abbey. <clears throat> I refer you to Appendix 1 to the letter from Perth and Kinross Planning Department which gives the reason for this as being in the interest of amenity and in order to protect the setting of Inchaffrey Abbey, which is a Category B listed building of archaeological, uh, of, sorry, of ar yes, of archaeological or historic interest and is a scheduled monument of national importance. Historic Environment Scotland have also classified the Abbey site and surroundings as a scheduled monument protected by the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act 1979. As such, further development is extremely unlikely. The scheduled area was moved back from the POW to the southwest corner of the remaining Abbey Wall after an archaeological excavation was undertaken to facilitate the planning consent for a house in 1987. This was conducted by a Mr Gordon Ewart and has been published by the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. So this is the paper. <clears throat> the, uh, 
The proposed house site was altered after the results of the archaeological investigation were known as a large building, which is in this position here, on this little plan, which is in the paper, was discovered. And this was just to the west of our, the current position of our house. Um, I'm sure you could have a copy of this. Uh, it would be helpful if I, I don't believe I've seen that document. No, we, only, we, only found, we only got it very recently, so... Potentially could be circulated. Do you have any copies with you? I don't. No. Just this copy. Okay. okay. Do you want? To, do you want to have a look? Um, I will suspend briefly at this point to allow everyone an opportunity to study this document. We just suspend briefly, please.
Thank you. I would like to invite Mr Watkins to continue. Thank you very much. And again, my apologies for the, uh, the uh, dis d delay. Um, so you will see that the um, area one, uh, which is positioned just to the west of our house, um, was uh, quite a large area which was excavated by Gordon Hewitt uh, and his team. Uh, and I think um, the final summary of the archaeological paper states that the evidence still remains largely underground and concludes with, there is little doubt that Inchaffrey may yet yield more crucial evidence. As a result of this survey, the uh, potential position of the house was moved east to be nearer the road in an area of point one of a hectare, which could be built on without causing too much damage to the underlying archaeology. The original house plans reveal that all wastewater is routed from the west side of our house to the east, then down past the garage to the septic tank to avoid Area 1 and any other archaeology. Even though the scheduled area was moved back from the POW to the Abbey Wall, we were, stroke R, required to obtain consent for any disturbance to the ground. Historic Scotland required us to have an archaeological watching brief for the erection of a fence around our proposed vegetable plot, which is at the southwestern end of our land, together with raised beds. Permission for the fence was granted, subject to ten conditions in the letter which you will now have uh, before you. I'm not going to read all the ten conditions because the most relevant one is that the posts of the fence to be constructed around the cultivated area should be inserted by driving into the ground rather than being placed into excavated holes. The reason being, of course, to ensure that damage to any archaeological deposits is minimised. <clears throat> we feel that the assumed value per acre for the land is also too great, as we are not in a housing development situation. And the promoter's residential assessment of 0.855 per acre is inaccurate. The area outlined in pink on your um, ordnance survey, thank you, ordnance uh, survey plan here is not correct. The actual um, scheduled area should be from the southwest corner of the abbey here to the northwest corner of the vegetable plot and then down to the pow. So neither the vegetable plot nor the front bit in the front garden or the part of the pond there should be in the scheduled area, apparently. <clears throat> the area we have outlined in this on blue, in blue, which will, if you've got, got a photocopy, will be between the house and the road, uh, is the, we feel, the point one of a hectare for residential use. The rest of the land, we feel, should be classed as amenity. <clears throat> We've based our original figures for the annual costs on the spreadsheet we were sent in June by McCash and Hunter, and understand that these are now incorrect. We also note that the rate has changed will affect and which and this will affect, of course, all the figures. Our original objection was because the new method for assessing properties had triggered a massive increase in our annual cost of drainage of five hundred percent. We note from the new schedule for heritors, which we were only able to look at yesterday, that the assessment is now £440.78 plus VAT. This still represents a 59.68% increase and comes to £528.86 with the VAT. Together with the annual charge for emptying the septic tank of £280, this comes to £808.86. And this is the actual cost to us for wastewater disposal, as we cannot reclaim VAT. This nearly 60% increase, we feel, is still a large burden for two people. We are also concerned about the possible financial consequences of updating the bill for all heritors, especially as this may mean a doubling of the in an initial annual payment after the bill has been passed to pay for the promoter's legal costs. If doubled, we would be paying £1,057.72p, that's including VAT, 
and adding the total cost, uh, adding the septic tank to that, the total cost would come to £1,337.72. pence. We do not feel the potential charge seems fair. The new figures which we looked at yesterday do not seem to be correct. On checking I times J for in Chaffrey Abbey, we discovered that the figure should be £440.44.5 pence, as opposed to £440.78, pence, which is 33.5 pence in the promoter's favour. When I checked the cheapest annual assessment for 5 Eden Square, which also has two people registered on the electoral roll, I noted it was £15.47. This is incorrect by 2 pence, and it should be £15.45. Pence. So I then checked some of the other figures for the residential properties and discovered that all, all of the ones I checked were incorrect by varying amounts, mostly pennies. I then checked the agricultural spreadsheet and discovered similar inaccuracies with the figures when multiplying column 16 by column 17. So I used a calculator to do this, and presumably the spreadsheet has some small glitch in it. Apart from being incorrect for the heritors, this obviously has implications for VAT returns. Finally, as our house is built on the driest piece of land in the Strathern Valley, we would argue the benefit to us is minimal. To summarise, in view of the Perth and Kinross planning restrictions for the residential put footprint of 0.1 of a hectare and the limitations imposed by Historic Scotland, we feel the new method for assessing our property is incorrect. Our private interests will be affected, not only by the financial burden, but will also cause difficulty if we decide to sell the property. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr Watkins. I now invite the promoters to cross-examine Mr Watkins, both on what he is, uh, a statement and, more generally, on the objection raised. Thank you. Good morning, Mr and Mrs Watkins. Um, good morning, convener and uh, committee members and, and, and all present today. Um, thank you for your, your submission. Um, can you confirm that I've understood you correctly, that you do not object to the principle of payment no, in terms of no, the assessment, not at all. It's, it's a, this is a dispute about the yeah. the area of assessment from yes. which is derived the annual yes. assessment. And yes. You, you, your position is that the actual area that should be assessed by the commissioners as the benefited area should be 0.247. Yes, 0.1 of a hectare. Which is the 0.1 deriving yes. from your planning permission, yes. as opposed to their assessment, which is 0 0.855. Absolutely. Just, just so we can understand what the, what the dispute is yes. about. Okay. Now... If you could turn initially to the to the pack of uh, documents which I lodged this morning, which you you should have had advance sight of, um, and we'd, I'd just like to take these through you and ask you some questions. Now I should say lodged with these papers are the schedule of ancient monuments, which I think you'd lodged with your objection and a copy of your planning permission as well, which. Um, I, I, I would assume you'd be familiar with. Yeah. Yep. It wasn't. We didn't actually build the house. It would like that. You know, it's. It was the original planners that. The plan. So, if we could turn to, to the document, document numbered one, which is an excerpt from the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological and uh, Archaeological Areas Act, 1979. Um, that, that's the first document there. And I think your case, as I understand it, if I've understood it correctly, is that the scheduling of the ancient monument, the Inchaffrey Abbey, places a considerable constraint on what can or cannot be developed in, on your land. And that's why you've produced the documents you produced this morning. And I think we can see in um, section two of the excerpt from the Act, which is document one, which says that if anyone causes or permits to be executed any works which affect the monument without getting consent, then that's a criminal offence. It is. And that's how the system of control yes. operates. Yes. Okay. thought we'd just go through that. Now, if we, if we now turn to document two, which is a document you produced in your objection, this is the entry in the schedule of ancient monuments under the Act. 
And on the first page I have here, it talks about the monument known as Enchaffrey Abbey and the early monastic site. Uh, if we turn over the page, we see uh, the, the actual legal entry uh, for that monument. We see, I think, uh, a registration of that document in the Register of Saisins at the bottom of the page, which shows it's been recorded against your title, so it has effect. Yes. And if we turn over the page, we see a map or plan which goes with the entry in which the scheduled area, and in fact, the, there are, if you just keep on continuing, you have that? Uh, I've got one, one map, but which one we That's the map, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. But you haven't got it in yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one map which yep. is attached to it, yep. but there are two areas outlined in red. Yes. yes. You can see that. And those outlined areas in red are the area of the scheduled ancient monument. So that's the it area is. to which the sort of level of high control or high restriction yes. compli yes. You know, takes effect from. And your, your house, I think, is built in the sort of southeast corner of the, um, just out with the area on the left-hand side. Yes. So it's out with the scheduled ancient monument. Yes, it's just quite close to it. Yes. Yeah. It's, so it's, we'll, we'll, yeah, okay. So we'll come to this in a moment. But, but your 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 garden extends, or or the area which the area of land which goes with your house sort of extends into the scheduled ancient monument. Yes, it yeah. it sort of comes around the ancient mon yeah. ancient monument. Now, if we could turn to the to the next document, which is the planning permission which you've lodged. Mm -hmm. This this is this is this is an outline planning permission which is dated 2nd September 1986. Yep. And it is for planning permission in principle for the erection of a dwelling house at Abbey Bridge, which yes. ultimately became your house. Yes. And you, your your case is based on condition four, and I'll read it to you. It says the house site shall be restricted to 0.1 acres to the satisfaction of the District Council as planning authority. Now, am I right in understanding that it's this, this 0.1 hectares yes. from which your 0 0.247 acres is derived, because that's yes. the kind of the, um, the imperial measurement of that metric. Now, it uses the expression there, the, the house site. What, what, what do you understand to be the house site for the purposes of your commission? I understand the house site to mean the house and the garden. Uh, I have to say that the actual house, the area of the actual house, the footprint of just the house and the garage, is approximately 438 square yards. And that's a lot less than 0.1. And I think they moved the house over towards the road uh, so that the, this area here could be excavated without um, damage to further damage to uh, any uh, archaeology which may be under the ground to the west of the, of the house. Did that, I'm sorry, did that make yeah, sense? I can understand where yeah. you're coming from. But w would you accept that the, the, the house and the garden which you enjoy currently is greater than 0.1 of a hectare or greater than well, 0.247? Well, the whole, the whole thing is, is yeah. 2.3 acres. But we are restricted... The valuation you have given us is on, based on residential land, you know, development land. That we feel that the value of the land that you are suggesting, you know, the, the price that you gave, that the figures were calculated 300, on, three hundred thousand pounds, because we cannot develop the garden. It's not residential. The whole lot. It's an amenity. It's amenity land. One moment, please. I just wish to advise that you do not need to operate your console or AV technician. We'll do that for you. Thank appreciate you. appreciate that. Sorry. Someone else is operating it. Thank you very much for that. OK, so we would we'll maybe return to these garden sizes when we, when we go through the documents. But, OK. But um, the, would you agree with me that in terms of the expression, the house site, that, that, that is, does, not, does not seem to exclude garden ground that goes with your house? It's just the house site. The house site, house, yeah. I would, I would think it would, should include the garden and the access. Right. Do you think it should include the garden and the access? I would think so. Okay, that's very fair of you. 
And then condition six is another condition which you make reference to, and, and it says that the site, it doesn't use the word house site, it just says the site this time, um, it shall be used for residential purposes only, and no agricultural or industrial development will be permitted on the site or in the immediate vicinity of the abbey. Now, um, that doesn't place a restriction on use for residential purposes, does it? It's just no, trying to does. stop. Well, it says it should be used for residential purposes only. Is it, is it not placing I, a restriction on the use for, well, I, finish, I for would, agricultural I would or think, industrial development? I would, think the, I would think it should say the house site. It's just that they are referring to the site, and we would interpret this as the site as being the house site. Yeah. But you, you, one of the hectares. You, you might choose to interpret it, but it could be interpreted another way. It could be. Okay. Thank you. That's fair of you. And then if we turn over the page um, the, where we have the reasons, and they seem to be highlighted here in the earlier four co copy, that four, reasons four to seven are in the interest of the amenity to protect the setting of the, of the abbey as yep. a category listed building in a scheduled ancient monument. Okay. Now, if we can move on to the next document, which is document four. Yep where we see uh, that's an aerial photograph of your house and garden and mm -hmm. including the abbey as well is it not mm -hmm. where, where, where can i just maybe ask you some questions here there looks to be some buildings which are um sort of built away from your house in what looks like you know possibly your garden what, what? yes they're wooden sheds and a greenhouse i have a greenhouse and a wooden shed okay and i have a workshop which is built on a concrete plinth, which has been there, I gather, since the, pre the last war. And that is um, just, uh, I was going to say north, but it's actually just to the east of the greenhouse. Of the greenhouse yes. So can, I, can I just be clear which, which is which? If we hold this up... So what, that's, that's, that, the, that's the veg plot. That that's trapezium the there is a veg plot. That's the veg plot. That's the, that's the document which the Historic Scotland letter refers to is it yes right so that's the historic that's the veg plot and that plot is actually was not in the scheduled area at the time so your pink bit on yeah i'll come to that in a moment okay yeah but we're just trying to so, so you have a a, a, a greenhouse a, 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 a greenhouse here yes and, th and that then, was that was a polytunnel before is that, is that no we never, no we, we didn't never, ever have right, the polytunnel okay. because okay. the because the uh historic scotland wanted us to have another archaeological watching brief we decided a, a, a greenhouse that was just placed on top of the earth right was so it's just better. placed on there yeah. and then you have this there's, there's another building here this that's is my that, workshop which that's, is on the concrete plinth. that's which is the on workshop the concrete and then plinth. there's another building to the left that's of the, a wooden shed. That's, that's a wooden the wooden shed. shed and there seems to be some other that's another wooden shed that's another wooden shed okay so the 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 areas here you are actually sort of using them in association with your House, is that correct? You must be, if it's yes. part of it. Yes. So what, what would you, I mean, leaving aside the, the, the restrictions which you discuss, what, what, what is considered to be your garden ground? And why, why should your garden ground be restricted to 0.247 of an acre? Well, because we are not allowed to dig into any of the scheduled area at all. Okay. And... As I mentioned um, earlier on, Area 1, which was excavated, is just to the west, we think, of uh, the house. And it's quite a large area. It's 9 metres by 13 metres. So we certainly wouldn't be able to build anything on that. And most of, the, most of this area now is down to grass, which Historic Scotland were very pleased with. And encourage us to keep it. They encourage us to keep it fairly short. So, if you could move from document four, mm -hmm. just briefly looking at document five. Yes. Which were these are just various uh, photographs of your house, and I think we can see some of the outbuildings in the first of the larger photograph. There, is that correct? Yes. yes. And the greenhouse is uh, on the left, and then the workshop okay. is a bit hidden by the tree, but it's okay. And then I don't think we need to trouble you with document six. But I would like to just turn to document seven, which you did make a reference to. Now, as, uh, you've obviously looked at this document before, but we can maybe just for the purposes of, a, of our conversation have a have a it's discussion document, about it. Which uh, sorry, which this is document, document seven? This, this one. It's number this, seven. It's where oh, you this, have the, the, the pink. Oh yeah, yeah, I've got it. Uh, yellow and the blue. Yeah, which I think you've mentioned. Now. <coughs> 
the area coloured yellow, starting with that, that that's excluded from yep, the yes. assessment because that's yeah. owned by the yep. Earl of Canoole, and that I think that's um, identified as as amenity land because it is the the, the, the core of the um, abbey. Now the area coloured pink is the area which I understand to be the scheduled ancient monument overlaid on top of your property. But it, this isn't correct. The pink area is not correct. Yeah. Can you maybe just explain to me what... I've actually drawn on here, which I think the correct bit is. Do you want to have a look at that? If I can, yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh, <laughs> dear. <laughs> OK, we're just going to suspend briefly. If, if, yeah.
I invite Mr Watkins to continue. I'm not quite sure where we were now, but... Um, um, yes, sir. Our, our understanding would be that the, the area I've coloured in blue, which is nearest the road, sort of trapezoidal area, which includes the house and the front lawn and the access, would be the point one of a, a, a hectare. And that the rest of the um, non-scheduled area, if you like, which I again have uh, put in a dotted red line on, uh, should be classed as amenity land. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I can I can understand your oh, arguments, okay. um, Mr. Watkin. That, okay, that, that's that's helpful. Um, but if if you could just briefly look at document two again, if you could, and just the, the plan that is attached to to that. That's the two we see the two areas outlined in red. Yep. That's that's the scheduled area. Yeah. What. And the area we are concentrating on here is, is, is the left-hand area, and slightly smaller. What, what I was trying to, to put to you was that the, the promoter has sought to draw those boundaries. I, I mean, you dispute what those boundaries are, but yes. the promoter has sought to draw those boundaries from a, from a quite a difficult scale of map here and translate them for a larger scale for the purposes of the proceedings today. Okay, that's just to sort of explain yes. where we're coming from. But, but, but in, in your in view, view, and you, you've obviously looked at it as well, on your assessment, leaving aside what you think should be your house and garden, which is the sort of dotted blue area, yes. what, what, what you have in fact done on the promoter's methodology would be to increase the blue area to include the triangle beneath the abbey and some of the additional area which is currently scheduled. Because you, you, what you're saying is the scheduling is in fact smaller than it appears on the promoter's plan number seven. I, I don't think so. Well, if you, if you, can you have, if you have the promoter's plan seven before you? Yeah, yeah. You'll correct. see the area coloured blue. Yes. If you were to follow the, the, the logic of this plan, which, which is basically to allocate your garden area. Now, I use that in its wider sense. I know we're disputing that. This blue, this yes, the blue would, would cover the veg, most of the veg plot. Yeah. It's quite hard to sort of pick that up, but, but if, if you look at the triangle between the... Sorry, maybe just start again. What the promoter is trying to do here is to take the area you own, remove the area which is owned by the Earl of Canoe, which is the yellow area, Yes. so, so that insofar as your garden in its widest sense, is, is affected by the scheduling. That's excluded from the assessment. Okay? okay? Yes. Okay? Now, what you've done is you've redrawn the boundary of the scheduled ancient monument. You think more accurately, and that maybe needs to be, be looked at. But you've, in, you've included an additional area, have you not? Yes, I'm talking about this bit here. The veg block, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, on this it's plan just, here, you, 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 you in effect... I'm including that area to the, the left, that's it, that left yeah, bit but there. But you're saying that the dotted red line here, that's really the, the line of the scheduling. Yes, yes. 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 Okay, Sorry. so I, I, th I think we are in agreement with that. So okay. if, if you were to take the, the, the logic of what the promoter has done here, and what the promoter is trying to do is to say to you that it is prepared to take a reasonable approach in regard to the area of assessment mm. and say that what you own minus the scheduled area is what should be your area of assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay? We would disagree with that because we think it should be this point one of a hectare in the front here. Y yes. Y the sorry, blue I, I know we're disagreeing. I'm, okay. You, sorry. So, so the, the, just so we can understand our respective mm. positions because we yes. now have slightly conflicting plans. So, so the promoter is saying um, that everything you own but less the scheduled area should be part of the assessment I as a residential that. area. And that's I where the 0.855 I understand hectare, that. hectare yes. comes from. Yes. That area may have to be increased if we were to follow your, the, the lines on your new plan. I, I'm just saying if you were to follow that same logic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciate you're disputing it. Yes, yes. But that would be but, the sort of natural we're, consequence. We're trying to, the bit here on there... We're claiming that that's amenity land. Well, I appreciate that. Land. Sorry. We, oh, okay. We, so so yeah. we're, we're, we're just trying to sort of... I, I do. I, okay. Just so yeah. we understand our okay. respective yeah, okay. positions here. So... Me, can yes. I just ask for a point of clarification from Mr. Um, Mr. Mrs. Watkins? When you say um, you've redrawn the blue line, 
and you say that that should be the area that's in, in, included for assessment for, for your property. What, why, why do you think it should be that? Because I'm not quite clear well, well, why the, is, well, the actual reason that, that there is a, a difference in what, what you say and what the promoters say. From, from, uh, originally, the planning people said that the house site, which I take to mean the house and the front garden and the access, <coughs> should be 0.1 of a hectare. Now, I think 0.1 of a hectare is probably about the size of this plot at the frontier. It might be actually slightly bigger, this plot at the frontier. But that's what I would understand as being the 0.1 of a hectare. So you've taken the measurement of 0.1 of a hectare and roughly calculated where that would be I've in relation to, to your house. I tried to triangulate this, yes, to, to, to work it out. Right, OK. I understand now. Thank you. OK. okay. So... I think I, I have to, to, to put it to you, Mr and Mrs Watkins, that, that the, the position of the promoter is not an unreasonable one in terms of identifying what is the sort of beneficial residential area for the purposes of the assessment, which is the, uh, for simplistic terms, on the, the area coloured blue on um, document 7, but perhaps nuanced with your uh, redrawing of the boundary of the scheduled ancient monument. As, as, a, as a sort of follow-up question, I mean, if, if, the, if the committee were to accept that your house should be 0 0.247, what, what, what would that be in terms of your assessment? Would it be, I mean, we could probably just have a look at the schedule if we would. If you could just have a look at the schedule in number eight. And it's actually in Chaffrey Abbey is shown on there. It's not. It's shown as four hundred and forty pounds seventy eight. And I know you've got some dispute about the kind of the, the, mm. the pence on it, but I'm told yes. that's rounding up from Excel spreadsheet. But that's four hundred and forty pounds based on a site area of zero point five, uh, zero point eight five five. Mm. But y you would agree if if it came to um, the 0 0.247, that, that would be probably be about £140, £150, pounds, wouldn't it? That would reduce it because it would be about almost less than a third of the area. Yes, I mean, we, would be, we the, would be happier with around £200, pounds, or maybe, maybe a bit more. Well, because we also have to pay VAT, which we can't claim back, and we have to pay £280 pounds a year to have the septic tank yeah. emptied. So where, that adds the cost yeah. up. Where, where does your septic tank drain into? Into the power. So it goes into the power? Yeah. OK. Right. I have no further questions. Okay. Do the promoters wish to make any further points with regards to the objection? have no questions, no further submission on that. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Mr and Mrs Watkins to cross-examine the promoters on what they said about their objection, both specifically to Diane more generally. Um, we feel there may be a conflict of interest on two fronts in putting forward this bill, as all commissioners are farmers, and there does not seem to be have been any residential input. Also, the land valuation and mapping has been performed by Savills, where Joe Guest is a director, and we do feel there is, and the valuation, we feel there's a conflict of interest. Would you like to comment? That is not accepted, but I'll, I'll invite Mr Guest to, to answer for Savills in, in that matter. Um, because we, it was much higher. We did ask various uh, estate agents, you rang up mm. several, and we felt that the valuation came back as extremely high in this case. Well, the, the, the approach to the valuation of the residential property and, uh, and the other categories of property, the starting point was we wanted to have um, values which could be, rather than valuing 
each property individually, we would have we would categorise the properties into the different types of land use. So farmland is broken down into the different grades of farmland, referring to the Macaulay land use, and then there's residential property, there's forestry, and there's commercial property. And we wanted to end up with bands of or values for each category of property, uh, so that when the um, so that the, the calculation of the individual assessment is a mechanical process, um, we wanted that to be the, the 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 idea of that is that it would be then simple and easily um, easy to. Um, Review because the bill includes a proposal for the uh, land to be revalued every 10 years or when there's a material change of use. So we were looking at, for instance, if you take the agricultural land, we looked at the values there. We haven't valued it on a field by field basis. We have said that the value of, I can't remember the exact figures now, but we've said, for instance, the value of, I think it's class three, one land is £6,000 an acre. We haven't said that we haven't gone round valuing each individual field. We've just um, taken that as the value for that category of land. And similarly with residential property, we have we have not um, uh, said that looked at the different house types. And uh, I mean, there, if you take there are there's a whole range of houses house types in the in the benefited area. There are small houses on. Uh, uh, semi-detached houses and terrace houses on uh, at Balgowan. There are um, cottages, there are larger detached houses and big gardens. We haven't gone and looked at each each single property. We have um, uh, lumped them all together, so to speak, and taken a, 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 a arrived at a global figure for residential development land. Now, these values were arrived at by I suppose by, by me, um, in discussion with um, Savills, have a, a lot of specialist departments dealing with all the different types of property. Did you not think you should have gone without of you know because of you've been bringing forward this bill that you should have perhaps t taken a wider view of this and gone and consulted further with other estates. Consulted an independent. An independent. independent. Well. Um, uh, I, said, uh, I suppose one could have done, but uh, we were we were looking at trying to do, you know, as you probably understand, this mm. this uh, the, the uh, commission has uh, a, a limited budget, and the budget is all raised from the heritors, and we were looking to do this as economically as possible, mm. um, uh, employing another 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 firm would have been. Uh, another expense. More expensive. Mm -hmm. um, in, in arriving at these at, at, at these values, I uh, Savills have specialist departments dealing with each each category of property. I, I do not confess to be an expert on every category of property mm -hmm. uh, myself. So I discussed it with all the experts in the individual departments, and it was based on that that these on the basis of those discussions that these figures were derived. Okay. Um, could you? We, we we'd like to know how residential property has been defined. Well, we've had. Um, we we in, in in the in the course of um, the the, proce the the progress of this bill, there have been there have been two alternative bases which have been looked at. The initial basis was that we would look at the plot. So to speak, on which the house is built, and the, the, the um, what we would what uh, the, the basis was that is that that land could not be that can be developed for residential purposes because of the um, benefit provided by the power and the power commission. We we um, we we close our eyes to the type of house that's on there because. The Power Commission didn't build the houses. All they did was enable the land to be developed for housing. So we looked at we looked at, in effect, um, 
undeveloped um, building land. Okay. So the approach was to look at measure the size of the um, plots on which those houses sit, mm. and then multiply that by a, a figure for residential development land in in this area. In this area. Okay. Um, there was concern expressed by um, the committee that that might be too broad brush an approach, and that it might disadvantage people with larger houses. So we were invited to come up with an alternative, which we did. And the alternative approach was to look at the, uh, in, in, instead of just measuring the plot, that we should look at the footprint of the house mm -hmm. and um, multiply it. I think we came up with a five times multiplier. So we'd mm -hmm. measure the footprint of the house, multiply it by five, mm -hmm. and that would be the notional. Yes. I see from the uh, spreadsheet we had this, that, that I, I would call that the older method, and I would think that that would seem to be a certainly from our point of view a better method. Well, um, anyway, uh, it, we, we, we but, proposed but, it um, as an alternative yeah. method and produced alternative workings on that basis. But yeah. Ultimately, it's not for us to decide; it's for the committee to decide. Yeah. I'm sort of getting away from that, really. But uh, uh, we were, we're interested to know what, how you would define residential property, as many of the farms had previously had accommodation for agricultural workers. That's true, but if the the the, the, the benefited land um, that there are no in, in 1846, when the mm. benefited land was defined, or 1851, mm. there were no residential properties on the benefited land at the time. No, mm. None at all. Yeah. So if, if these properties are now let out or sold to people not involved in farming, does That's this right. mean that the occupants should be paying the residential rate, or are they still combined there with the farms, are, or there do are they no, have a private arrangement? In 1851, all the houses on the benefited land were built after the, 1840, after the improvements carried out under the 1846 Act. Yes. There were none before. I think all farmhouses would be classed as residential. I don't think there's any there that are... Classes no, but they, they don't well. appear on. No, they don't are, appear on the residential. There are no farmhouses because they're not on the benefited land. Ah, okay, so none of them are on the benefited. No, land. the okay. reason the reason is because the uh, uh, the in, the benefited land was the land which it, 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 before eighteen forty six people did not build their houses sure. on boggy land. Yeah. they built them on yeah, the yeah, edge. Yeah, yeah, and so they're not on the on yes. the soft land. I which has benefited from the work the power. I can understand that as my poor workshop is dropping to bits because it's yeah. too near the power thing. Anyway, there we are. Um, um, I think the final thing I would have to say is if, if, if we were un unhappy with the outcome of this meeting, is there a mechanism for appeal against the decision? Which decision? Well, the decision on what, what, what we're going to have to pay, going to have to pay for, the, for, for, for drainage. Um, well, I, I, for the committee to advise, but I mean, my understanding is that we're not so much, we are not in so much interested in the number, we're interested in the method. Right. It's the approach, it's the, it's the, uh, the approach, the approach to defining to, okay. benefited land and how it's, it's got to be logical. Okay. And that, that's what that's our approach. We're, we're we're blind to the figures, to be honest. Okay. It's the process. I think that's that's all we have to ask. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Before um, moving to closing remarks, can I just ask the promoters if they envisage any further amendments, changes, or redrawings of the land plans that were submitted? We, Mr. Watkins' concerns about his historic area. Oh, right. So that wouldn't be a land plan. It's just a change in the classification. Okay. Okay. There are, there, are, there are no additional land plans or, or replacements. I think if, if, if there was an adjustment required by what we've heard today, that's a change in classification of the land, it's still benefited land, it's just being classified as either residential or amenity, so that doesn't alter. You anticipate my second question, <laughs> Mr McKee. Do you, in terms of classification, do the promoters envisage any further adjustments? Well, the, 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 there may be some nuanced adjustment if, if the 
boundary of the scheduled ancient monument is, you know, as Mr. Watkins says, as opposed to the way the, the promoter has interpreted it from the scheduled plan. So there may be some slight adjustment on that, which would change the area from 0.55 to something a bit more than that. Or it may come down if it's finally checked, but we were fairly confident that we'd got the right plan on the one we've lodged. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now move to brief closing remarks. I'd like to invite Mr and Mrs Watkins to make their closing remarks. Um, well, you can probably tell we're unhappy with a potential, uh, is it 60% increase in the annual fee for um, the powers? Certainly nothing much has changed. In fact, uh, we probably produce less wastewater now because our son no longer lives at home. Um, and I and think the fact that's that it will deep, it will affect if if and when we decide we need to set, we want to sell the house. Um, this is you know going to be quite a something we will have to declare, and will probably discourage possible per purchases of the property. That's all I have to say. I have to yes, sir. Okay. I now invite the promoters to make any closing remarks. Um, the, the, there is really no dispute on the principle of payment. This is a dispute about the area of assessment. Uh, the commissioners have sought to treat the objectors, Mr and Mrs Watkins, fairly and reasonably in terms of that level of assessment and what should be applied to their property. Um, the, the commissioners consider that the area of assessment ought to be around about 0 0.855 acres, or that, although there may be some nuance to that, as I've said, w w once we finally determine the boundary of the scheduled ancient monument. Uh, and really that, rather than the 0 0.247 acres suggested by Mr and Mrs Watkins. Um, the, the lesser area suggested by Mr and Mrs Watkins is derived from condition I think it, it's, uh, I'll just say it's from, from the terms of their planning permission, and the point one becomes 0 0.247 acres. Um, in the Commissioner's views, that does not form a reasonable basis on which to restrict the assessment. Um, what, what the Promoters' Commissioners have sought to do here is take a very reasonable approach, uh, except that the Schedule Ancient Monument does create some form of restriction although it obviously hasn't affected the, the tree felling in the polytunnel, but it does have a level of restriction. and It, it, it was really to exclude that area uh, from, from the assessment. I mean, if, if, if the area were to be restricted to 0 0.247 acres, that's about three and a half times smaller than what the promoters think is the reasonable usage of the garden ground. And one can see from the aerial photograph that it is being used. Um, so the... Uh, the, the, the promoter's basis is that the, the area of assessment, which is what we're discussing, should be the area coloured blue on Plan 7, subject to whatever adjustment um, might arrive from a final measurement of exactly where the scheduled ancient monument applies. Thank you. Thank you. It just remains for me to say on behalf of the committee, thank you to both Mr and Mrs Watkins and the promoters and the representatives for attending today. We will now suspend it to allow a change of objector.
We will now recommence proceedings, and again, I encourage all speakers to be as concise as possible. I invite Mr McGregor to open proceedings by setting out the points he wishes to make regarding his objection. Mr McGregor. Uh, morning, Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to keep this quite short, quite brief. I think it gets to my point without too much arguments. Um, I've already submitted my objection, which you take it you've all read. Um, and I do not accept the assumptions that our house at Nethermains of Gorthy was built on so-called benefited land because of the reasons that were outlined in Mr Tate's submission, which I referred to in my initial objection. He is a retired civil engineer, a company director who specialised in water supplies and drainage systems. His detailed findings concluded that the level of benefited land on the south of the Pau, opposite Nethermains of Gorthy, is determined at an altitude of 39.05 metres. The boundary fence of my property lies at 39.4 metres. My actual property lies slightly higher than this, if we include the property as the house and not the garden. Since the POW and the altitude of benefited land is common to both north and south, I fail to see why the north side should be treated any differently to that of the south and therefore totally reject the assertions that my property be included on benefited land. Furthermore, the level of benefited land on the south seems to have been meticulously defined, running almost in line with the 40-metre contour on the original plans. However, on the north side, it appears to just run along boundaries and straight lines. Properties dating back pre-1846, as already mentioned, were deemed not to have been built in benefit of land. I question the close proximity of my property to my neighbours, the Steading, owned by Mr and Mrs Tate, which was built prior to 1846. The Steading is merely 170 millimetres higher than the level of my boundary fence. This indicates to me my property does not lie on benefit of land. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McGregor. I now invite the promoters to cross-examine Mr McGregor, both on the points he has made today and more generally with regards to his objection. Thank you. Good morning, Mr McGregor. Do you have before you the pack of papers which start with POW of Inchaffrey Drainage Commission Scotland Bill? There's 15 documents attached yeah, to this. Well, yeah. Okay. Could, could you firstly uh, turn to document 8, and the, the number, if you can just leaf through them? And document 8 is a schedule in A4. Have you found the schedule? You found it, Mr McGregor? Yeah, yep. yep. if you can go to... You'll see there's a list of properties on the left-hand side column. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in property, se property 13 Centre Cottage, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Right, and if we, if we move along here... And then we see at the, the the actual level of the assessment, the annual assessment proposed on a £20,000 um, budget is £118.57. That's correct. Yeah, you can see that. I just wanted to clarify that with you. Okay. Now, your, your principal contention, Mr McGregor, is that your property centre cottage at Nether Mains of Gorthy is not constructed on benefited land. I think that's your, that's your big point, and yes, therefore, in a sense, it shouldn't, yeah. be, shouldn't be payable. Could I then ask you to turn to document 9, please? And that is a fair copy excerpt of the 1850 plan which accompanied the, the Power of Inchaffrey 1846 bill. And on there we can see uh, some properties which are coloured pink. They're described as West Mains, but are, th are those the steading you talked about? That's now known as the steading. They're now known as the steading. Yep. And wh where in proximity to the steading is, is your property constructed? South of that, below, below the line, if you can see from the letter E in West, uh -huh. it appears as a track or a, a double line running to the yeah. left. So it's south My of... property is just on that line. Right, so it's south of that double line, and there are two other properties beside your property, two other there cottages. Are. Okay. Okay. 
Now, if you, if you move down into that, what looks like a kind of an enclosure or a field, there, there's a number which I can read on there. Uh, I, I think it. I think it's 130. I'm told. You see, there's a plot number. I can see that. Yeah. Yep. You can see that plot number, and then beside that, you see there's a plot 122 as well, which is in a different area. Now, can can we agree that your house is built on what is identified on that 1850 map as plot 130? I could only assume so. Yeah, without actually seeing the property on this map, I can yep. only assume yep. that it's there. Okay, that's fine. Okay, now if we could turn to uh, the, ju sorry, just before we, 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 we move on there, can, can we just go back to the, back to that plan? Can, can you identify on that plan, this is the 1850 plan, where the Cars Mile burn is or the Downey burn, there seems to be some dispute. Um, if you look at the, on West Mains, okay. Uh -huh. If you look at the E in West, yes. there's a faint double line there that's coloured faintly blue. I can see that. Yep. And at the S, there is another line, double line, which comes down and bends down the hill. Yes, I can see that. There's yeah. like two burns that are converging. There's two that? burns that come together. The one that's coloured blue is the downy burn. Uh -huh. And the one which has got no colour in it or is white is referred to as the Carshead Mill or Mile. Said, it, there's three different names for the burn. These two converge some distance further down in the field. So they actually converge, and then they... They come down into the and, field and at the what, bottom. What do they drain into? Uh, ultimately, the pow. So they drain into the pow. Thank yep. you. Okay. In now, fact, if you refer to plan 10... Yeah, I'm just... Yeah, we're just going over here to plan 10, yeah. Right. So this, this, this bears to be a plan which is an 1864 plan. Mm-hmm. OK, but if we just contrast it, if we just go back for a moment to Plan 9, can, can we agree that, that your, your properties are not shown on the 1850 plan? Correct. So they must have been built subsequent to that? Not necessarily. Right. Depends on when the survey was done for the land. I did get in touch with Historic Scotland, and they cannot confirm an exact date of uh, construction of my property. OK, but, but they're not on that plan, and that's, that's the certified plan. So no, matter of fact that they're not on the plan. Yeah. Okay. Okay, if we can go back to, to plan number ten, which is the eighteen sixty four plan, and then we see in the sort of near enough in the centre a property description called Nether Mains. And I think we can see the, the sort of the the steading which is kind of like C shape in there. Correct. Which is what I think we saw in plan nine. Yep. But then we see some new properties which are which certainly look to me like properties that have been built immediately to the south of that. I would say property. There's property. only one. Wh which, which one do you think that is? That's mine. That's your property. So on, on the basis of this being an 1864 plan, we can, we can say that by 1864 it's certainly been built. Oh, without a doubt, it's on the okay. map, yeah. Thank you very much. And I think you're going to make a further observation about the, the Cars Mile or Cars Head Mile Mill burn and the Downey burn going into the POW, is that...? Yeah, this, although this map is, yeah, it's, like you say, it's been printed, it's quite unclear, but on the T of Nether, that is the Downey burn, and then on the converse of the H and the E is the Carshead Mill burn. Okay. They both join further down the field, if you can see a line which comes across, that's where they actually join. But the Downey burn, um, dating back on maps that I don't have with me, unfortunately, does extend some, it's about four miles further up the hill to Fowles Wester. That's where it originates. Okay. And it comes all the way down the hill, right down to there. Why it changes name where these two natural and man-made watercourses join, I don't know. I have also seen on a previous map, which I don't have, <laughs> that it did say Downey Burn and it had been opaqued over. Okay. So there's there's some some th th there's some doubt about what they're called, but there's no one thing is not in doubt is that both of them drain into the pow. Correct. Thank you. But th what I would question is one is man-made, one is natural. Yeah. Well, if you if you if you go back to um, plan nine, I mean, is it, to me it looks as if the burns here are, are very straight. They look as if they have been altered to be in a dead straight line. 
if you were to visit it and see it in the flesh, you would you would fear to differ. Okay, well, we'll pick for the up. simple reason as well, which is once again referred to in Mr. Tate's uh, submission. The, if we look at it, the, the left is the downy, the right is the car said. The car said burn is some, and I forget the numbers, about two foot deeper okay. than the downy burn. Yet they're only a couple of feet apart. Right. It's obviously one's man made, one's not. Right. We'll, we'll maybe turn to that in some of the other plans. If, we could, if you could have um, document 11 before you, Mr. McGregor, and yep. if we could turn to paragraph 6, just, just to introduce the, 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 the context of this document, which is important. The, the, this, this is an opinion of uh, counsel which the promoter obtained in, in terms of guiding them in terms of the proper interpretation of what should or should not be benefited land. And it, it was unfortunate that your property wasn't picked up in the first assessment of what was benefited land. But I'm, I'm giving you a reassurance that that has been checked. And if I can maybe just read paragraph six to you, um, and this is from council's opinion, it says, there was an area of land at Nether Mains of Gorthy containing three houses, one of which is yours, which is the centre cottage, which were identified at the consultation as having been excluded from the original plans. That's the original plans we put in. Today we're dealing with the replacement plans which include your land as benefited land. He's also talking about a further uh, area of land at Mill Hill, and then he goes on to say, in respect of both these areas, none of those houses are shown as existing buildings on the 1848 plan. They are both areas of ground that can be identified from the book of reference, the estimate of increased value, and the 1848 plan as having been improved by the works under the 1846 Act. In my opinion, both areas ought to be shown on the replacement plans as benefited land. The owners of the houses on that land will require to be notified, which is where we are today after you've been uh, notified. That's just a sort of explanation and, and something of an apology to you as well. It is a sincere apology. that It wasn't picked up first time round. Can I just add something here as well? Yeah, come back at me by all means. Yeah. Uh, the owners of the houses on that land will require to be notified of the change. There's three houses there. Only two of the owners have been notified. Yeah. The third one hasn't. Well, I'm, I'm not in a position to... to answer that. I no, I'm just saying if that's the case for them not being notified, how accurate is, is all this writing and all these things? You know, how accurate are they? Well, There's mistakes being made all over the place. Yeah, we, we, it's, you, you're entitled to your opinions, but I don't necessarily ag agree with them, okay. uh, Mr McGregor. Now, if you could turn to um, Plan 12, which is described as the, which is Document 12, which is described as the burn map in 1846. And I should say there's, a, there's, a, there's been a, a series of plans which were undertaken uh, prior to the, or surveys undertaken prior to the POW works in 1846. And this is, this is a, a map or a, a sort of an excerpt of a map showing your particular area where uh, improvements to the POW and its tributaries were, were um, undertaken. Now, if we, if we look at this map, you'd agree we can see West Mains, we see the kind of C-shaped steading which we saw in the 1850 plan. Can you see that? Uh, would you agree with me that, that we see no identification of Centre Cottage or any other cottages on that plan? I can't argue with that, yeah. Okay. Now, can you see, can you see the dotted, there's dotted lines which, which go and march on either side of the Carsmile Burn and the Downey Burn? Mm -hmm. Now, I am advised that these are showing evidence of spoil. Yeah, and I think it does actually... Limit, limit for deposit of spoil. Yeah, it says limit for deposit of spoil. I think that's what they're annotated as. W would you agree with me that that indicates powerfully that there were works carried out in 1846 in relation to the um, Carsed Mile burn and in relation to the Downey burn? It's all about interpretation on that one. I mean, I'm not a, a civil engineer or anything like that. However, if I look at that map, to me, let's refer to them as blue and pink. If you're digging out the pink burn, where are you going to deposit the soil? On the right-hand side of the pink burn. If you're digging out the pink burn, where are you going to deposit the soil on the left-hand side? It's got to be the left-hand side of the blue burn. That does not necessarily mean the blue burn has been dug out. Yeah. If you well, were to dump the soil from the pink into the blue, you'd cause a dam. Yeah. Well, be, be that so as I, it, don't, I yeah. don't follow that, and I don't agree with what you've said there. But, but, well, be that, be that as it may, um, 
the, the, the dotted line on the surveyor's plan does talk about the, the estimated line of the spoil. I mean, that's that's what the annotation says. I mean, ju just just looking at the, 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 should we say, the car smile upon the area coloured blue, is, is there anything that, uh, about that that strikes you as unusual? In terms of what? No, well, no. just in terms of, 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 of it being in a dead straight line? No. Do you think that's a natural feature or more likely to be an artificial feature? Natural, 100%. Mm. I state that, in, once again, without actually physically seeing it. If you were to have a walk down there, there are trees there. Now, these trees, once again, I'm not a tree surgeon or a professional tree man, but these trees are big. And I would say that they are well over 100 years old, maybe even more, 150 years, I don't know. The roots from these trees are visible in the blue burn all the way down. They haven't been cut off, they've not been excavated, they're bare roots that are lying in the burn. Why, why would it be a natural straight thing if they've been dug out and the tree roots are still there? Well, that's just because nature doesn't tend to do things in a dead straight line. That's just my assumption then. OK. If we move on, and, and we can see the, 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 the field enclosure 130 on there as well, in, in the field where your house is um, yet to be built, with the dotted line going through it. You can see that, can you? Mm-hmm. OK. Now, if we, if we move on to the next plan, which is document 13, which is a surveyor's plan, and this is a fair copy of a surveyor's plan, um, which was executed in 1940. And the, the areas which are outlined in red are areas where the um, POW commissioners have been involved in executing works. Okay? Now, if we move along, I think it's probably the, the is it the, um, the leftmost red line? Would you agree with me that that's, that red line is going along the line roughly of the Carshead Mile Burn? In there, roughly, yeah. Yeah, and and w w would you agree with me that that if this is a copy of a 1940 plan, which is which depicts where works are carried out, it's pretty clear that the commissioners have been undertaking work in that general area. I couldn't comment on that. Okay. Looking at a map, it's hard to say whether work's been carried out or not, just by looking at a line on a bit of paper. Okay. But you, you do appreciate someone, it's, it's a red line on it, so it has some significance. No. Right. There well, was red lines put on a map earlier on, which I believe Mr Willett was made aware of at the committee meeting, that were in a totally wrong place. Right. Now, I don't know if you've amended them or not. Well, this is the the this ones is, that Mr Tate yeah, pointed we're, out. We're dealing with this map just now, if we could, you know, Mr Willett is in this conversation. Yeah, you can so ask I questions. cannot agree with what you've said right. there. Not. You, you, you're, not, you're not in agreement, so, no. but you're, you're not in a position to... to deny that this is not a 1940 plan showing a red line where the commissioners have carried out work. No, well, it is what it is. It's a 1940 plan. OK. And if we could turn over the document, next page, to the plan 14, which is the middle section, plan 1 of 1. And I think it's maybe the maybe the maybe near the centre of the page. Again, we can see the car smile burn and the, the red line which shows this is on the, the this is on the land plans that which go with the current bill where the commissioners execute works. This has been amended to show two dots. Yeah. It's got the concert mile and the other one. Yeah, I can't actually see it's that. It's too small a scale. Okay. But if you look if you look at that map again, the car said mile, if you refer to that one and then carry on north, north of Mm -hmm. Well, my property on the other means of Gorthy is referred to as the Downey Burn. Yeah. If that Downey Burn was indeed man-made, then if you continue northwards, why is it such a meander in it? Well, is it, is it not possible that works were carried out in, in the section where it's straight and works weren't carried out where it meanders? <laughs> not when you look at the tree roots in it. I'm afraid there'd be no work carried out in that burn for exactly. years and years. Until you actually come and walk down it, you, you couldn't appreciate what I'm saying. No, you, you'll I don't see how that's got to do with my house being benefit land or not. We'll, we'll come to that in a moment, but you have a chance to ask questions of the promoter. Okay, um, sorry. Okay, yeah. so, so if you could then have before you document 15A, 
which is the last of the documents, 1515b. Okay, and I maybe just need to explain this a, a little about how this works. When when the works were carried out in in 1846, Mr. McGregor, an initial survey was done beforehand to take account of the value of the land at that stage. Once the works were then completed, the increase in value was then calculated. So it showed the extent to which the land had been improved by the POW works. And it is, it is that improvement on the land that creates what we describe as benefited land. Now, if you look at um, document 15A, Document 15A and 15B are actually two pages that go together um, because they, they, you know, they, they, it's just due to the, the way it's been copied. But document 15A is, is a statement of the increase in value of the land after the works have been completed. And if you look at 15A, if you, if you scroll down to the plot numbers, you will see on that document, one, two, three, four, five up from the bottom, the plot 130. Okay, can you see that? Yep. And if you go over the page, and if we go one, two, three, four, I think it's five up on there, it shows that the rate per acre is nine shillings. And it, beside that, it says the increased annual value is three pounds, eight shillings and three pence. OK, so what, what I'm putting to you, um, Mr. McGregor, is if you look at that document, which is showing plot 130 had increased in value, we then go back, if you could for a moment, to document document 9. This demonstrates that your house, which is Centre Cottage, is built on plot 130. And plot 130, in accordance with the documents that are associated with the 1846 Act, was increased in value as a result of the works. So therefore, your house is on benefited land. Now, I appreciate that you may not have previously received assessments, and I think the, the, the promoter's position is that it may well be when the farmland was sold off a contribution was taken from the farmer on the farmland. But unfortunately, no assessment was made of your property. But that doesn't change the fact that your property has been built on benefited land. OK, no further questions. Thank you. Uh, is there any other remarks that the promoters wish to make at this stage? Do we want to address this document? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, j j just one comment. It's really to do with the document which uh, Mr. McGregor kindly lodged this morning. And if you look at that document, and it's, a, it's particulars of, of sale, uh, and if you look at page three, we'll see in here lot two, and it's got an outgoing, which is the Power of Inchaffray Drainage Commission dues to be allocated. And I think this is a 1984 um, document. It is... I think the, the, the assumption that's being made, because it happened some time ago, is that, as I put to Mr McGregor, that, that both the cottage and the land were being assessed as one. And when they were separated off, no assessment was then sought for the cottage. It was just taken from the farm, and it's, it's slightly lost in the, in the eons of time. But as a result of the, the new assessment record, which was trying to be as faithful as it could be to the original benefited land, I think it is beyond doubt that... Mr. McGregor's cottage and the two other cottages are on benefited land. Before moving on, there's two points I wish to clarify. The cast head, cast mile and, and yep. downy burns. Is there maintenance and work still undertaken by the Commission on these water crosses? There, there are a number of side ditches um, on the on the POW which were um, which were burns there are, and they're still called burn. So the, the cast head the, the, the cow gas burn is one of the principal side ditches, and it's a, it's a, as the name implies, it's a burn which has been improved and straightened, and which the commission uh, uh, carry out works to from time to time. There's another one called the Jesse burn, which comes in at Balgowan. There's another one which comes in at Drumfin called the Drumfin burn. So there are a series of these 
uh, side ditches which are which were natural watercourses which have been improved and for which the Commission have responsibility. When we do the um, we, we do an inspection of the power twice a year and the surveyor has to write a report and all the side ditches for which the Commission are responsible, which include these ones, are there's a report on the condition of them and whether work needs to be done. Some of them work gets done on more frequently than others. I, I have to confess that on the Cast Head Mile there hasn't been much work done there for some considerable time. Uh, the Drumfin Burn, for instance, has been no work done for years. Uh, the Jesse Burn, there's been no work done for years. Others of them where they are uh, uh, the flatter gradient and they tend to silt up, work is done more often. For instance, the Cow Gas Burn we clean out fairly regularly. So the fact that we haven't done anything there much for in recent years doesn't it doesn't take away the fact that the commission are still responsible as a maintenance obligation there if a bank collapsed or if a tree fell across and was brought to our attention we would have to go and deal with it thank you i appreciate that clarification there's one further point uh, in terms of benefited landers properties which could be categorized as directly benefiting from the power they drain directly into the power and there's others if I could categorise as indirect drain drain into tributaries which subsequently go on to join the POW. Are you aware of any properties which benefit indirectly, they drain into a tributary but they are not in benefited land? Perhaps further upstream of a particular tributary burn? Well they might be they might go into the into the site ditch but beyond the area for which the Commission are responsible for the okay. maintenance. Thank you, just to clarify. Mm. Okay, I would now like to invite Mr McGregor to cross-examine the promoters, both in the points he raised and more generally. Yeah, the document that I gave to you earlier on, um, if you have a look at it, it's, it refers to three, three lots, lot one, two and three. Lot two is the one which has got the outgoings, which is the Power and Chaffrey Drainage Commission due to be allocated for lot two. Okay. Lot three is the cottage is located between the farmhouse and a separately owned property known as Burnside Cottage. Lot 3 is my property. And there is no mention under Lot 3 of any bill for the Power of and Chaffrey Drainage Commission. OK, so that's purely for Lot 2, not Lot 3. My property is Lot 3. I refer back to 15A and 15B. Once again, apologies, I don't have the copy of this document with me. I have seen it. We have worked out with myself and Mr Tate, and now you were to do the figures without being 100% accurate, because I can't remember which ones it is, there are two of the sums on this document that are wrong. I can't remember which ones. I can get back to you with them if you need them, but the maths for two of them don't add up. Now, I, like I say, I don't know which ones it is, but that needs investigating. If they are incorrect, then... Perhaps it's my one at 130. I'm not sure. They are wrong, though. Yeah. And if we're relying on documents like this to deem whether my property is on benefit land or not, I would expect them to be correct. Um, as far as the maintenance goes on the, the Downey Burn, I've lived in my property for 15 years. Not once have I seen any maintenance done on the Downey Burn or the field down to the to the Pow. I haven't seen it. And I refer to my original thing. I don't believe that the altitude of 39.05 on the south and 39.4 on the north have been treated fairly as benefited land. What is benefited land? Is it somewhere that benefits financially or somewhere that benefits from drainage or flood alleviation? If that's the case, why are they at different heights, one north and one south? I have a lot that I could go on about, especially inconsistencies in minutes of meetings, etc., etc., but unless they're absolutely necessary, I'm not going to. OK, I have uh, nothing further to ask. Thank you. Thank you. If I could ask Mr McGregor that you could write to the committee, um, setting out in more detail the concerns raised in the specific uh, papers 15A and B. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and we will, of course, make sure that is circulated to the 
promoters as well and put on the Parliament website. Um, I'd like to invite you, Mr McGregor to make any closing remarks. One final thing I, I would like to do, I would like to request that the, the Commission carry out an entire survey of the area which they define as benefited land for the whole of the POW, using modern techniques, modern technology, modern survey equipment, and determine precisely which land is benefited and which is not. Perhaps using, in conjunction with the SEPA flood plans, because our property appears as zero risk of flooding. I know it's been mentioned in the past that this is not a flood thing, this is a drainage commission, but there have been instances which are referred to in my original objection that flood alleviation has been mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to, thank you very much. I'd like to invite the promoters to make any closing remarks. Should wish to. Thank you. Um, just, just picking up on the point which Mr McGregor has made there, the, the commissioners did consider whether they should carry out a survey, a detailed survey, to establish the benefited land and looked into that in some detail and took the decision that it was, um, it was acceptable for them to rely upon the work which had been carried out pursuant to the 1846 Act, and that's the basis on which the plans have been drawn. Um, th there may be issues with, with how long ago it was, but it, is, it was believed to be accurate. Um, it, is, um, it, it would be financially unviable to carry out a survey of all of the properties. It may not even be possible because of land changes and the works have actually now been carried out. So the, the promoter is content to rely upon the 1846 Act and you, you'll have seen in the basis of the um, assessment for the preparation of the plans which was submitted in April by Savills that that is the, 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 the basis on which um, the plans were taken forward. The, the promoter I think has, has demonstrated that Mr. McGregor's, uh, Mr. and Mrs. McGregor's house uh, as Centre Cottage at Nether Mains of Gorthy was constructed after the improvement works had been undertaken and therefore have a dependency on those works having been undertaken and there's therefore no question that it was built on benefited land. Mr. McGregor's house, uh, if one looks at the 1850 plan, you can see it isn't there. Uh, it's also not present on the 1846 plan which we, which we went through. I don't think there's any doubt that plot 130 was subject to an increase in value as a result of the works, and that is the basis that reaches a conclusion that land has been benefited and is thus benefited land. And that's demonstrated on document 15A and 15B. So the, the promoters, in my view, were correct to include it. You do have the promoter's sincere apologies for, for not including it in the first place, but the, it only came to light as a result of a, of a, of a further assessment um, earlier this year. The, I think the issue about the Downey Burn, the Karst Mile Burn, or whatever they're called, is, is somewhat of a red herring because they both drain into the POW. I think the plans indicate quite powerfully that there has been works historically carried out to them as shown in the dotted line on the 1846 burn plan. Uh, we can also see that the burn, uh, uh, such as it is, is on a dead straight line, which, which I think does indicate it is not a natural course of water and it has been altered. And it has been altered in the promoter's view to improve its, uh, its flow. The Karst Mile burn and the Downey burn were included in the 1940 plan, so at some stage they have had attention from the commissioners. They are identified on the current land plans, which are as part of the sort of the, the feeder network to the POW. Um, so I think in summary, it's, it's regrettable that the objector's property wasn't included earlier in the land plans, but it is correct to include it at this stage. And the promoter's approach um, to that is consistent with the overall methodology for the entire redrafting of the land plans and the identification of benefited land across all of the properties. All is set out in the um, explanatory report submitted by um, the promoter's agent, Savills, in April of this year. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr McGregor.
Thank you. It just remains more for me to thank Mr McGregor and the promoters uh, for attending this morning. The next meeting of the committee will be on Wednesday, 26 September 2018 at 10 a.m. and will be to consider the objections and the committee's second consideration stage report. The committee will now move into private, so I suspend. <laughs>